Matthew Broughton's play now is A True Story, based on the memoir of Pauline Butcher. It's about the meeting of two very different minds, Frank Zappa and me. In the summer of 1967, I was 21 years old. I worked as an agency secretary in the West End. Twenty girls, seated in squares of four, with golf ball typewriters. We typed menus, programs, adverts, scripts, and ran around town with our notebooks, too. Forum Secretarial Services, how may I help? What name, please? I took the call that day, so the job was left to me. Taxi! Royal Garden Hotel, Kensington, please. I was wearing a green mini dress with a white collar, calf length white boots, and my hair was cut by Vidal Sassoon in the Faye Dunaway Bonnie and Clyde style. The agency's clients included the Duchess of Argyle, Gregory Peck, Marcel Marceau, and the grandson of Haile Selassie, the Emperor of Ethiopia. But mostly they were business executives. That's who I was expecting. Mr. Zappa sounded like a foreign, fat, bald man. Hi. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I've got the wrong room. Uh, I'm looking for 412. Pauline? He had ink-black curls that fell below his shoulders, a long, thin face, a drooping moustache, and he was wearing an orange T-shirt with pink trousers. Are you Pauline? Pauline Butcher, yes? I'm Frank Zappa. Come in. Oh. Hey, everyone, this is Pauline. Hey there. <laughs> Pauline, this is everyone. And this is her. Hi, Pauline. Hello. Did you know you're working for a rock star, miss? Are you a musician, Mr. Zappa? Uh, I play a little. Ignore his false modesty. Herb is my manager. Should I know who you are? Have you seen this? Uh, the mothers of invention. Absolutely free. Is this your LP? We're the ugly guys on the front. I wouldn't say that. I only allow ugly people in my band. Everyone's doing the pretty thing. We do ugly because society is ugly. And... What secretarial work needs to be done? <laughs> <laughs> she don't beat round the bush. Follow me, Polly. Oh, OK. He took me into a room where we were alone with a tape player. I need you to listen to these songs and type the lyrics. We send copies to our fans. Can you do that by tomorrow? I'll take it down as shorthand and type it up tonight. Great. Track listings are on the sleeve. Just holler if you need anything. I will. <laughs> Track one... Plastic people. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Bella Americans. <laughs> He's been sick. I <laughs> think his wife. Mr. Zappa. Pauline. I'm afraid I only speak English. It is English. Oh. I see. <laughs> Excuse me. He's been sick. He's been sick. I think his wife. Mr. Zappa. Is there a problem? Is it he's been sick or he had sex? <laughs> well, you don't know? It's a little gobbledygookish. Well, put down what you think it is. We'll take it from there. As you wish. I wound on to the next track. I'm going to be through the prune in June. For the next few hours, I was concentrating hard. Call any vegetable, call any company. Call any vegetables. I worked my way through the tracks. 
invocation and ritual dance of the young pumpkin, Amnesia Vivace, Big Leg Emma, and after a while, I started to enjoy it. Really enjoy it. You got me thinking all my name. You got me thinking all my name. How did it go? More gobbledygook? I'll return with a typed copy tomorrow. Good. So, is there any more to Pauline Butcher than typing? I... I wanted to go to university, but my education got interrupted. Education can destroy your mind. Go to a library and teach yourself. I read widely, actually, and watch educational programs on the television. I bet you do. He appeared to be listening. Hey, when I was 15, I'd been in six different high schools. Formal education can be a drag. (laughs) (laughs) Male bosses never spoke so personally with me. It was a shock. With his weird moustache, ridiculous clothes and oddball hair, he was really quite different from any man I'd ever met. Farewell, Pauline. Until tomorrow. Did I do something wrong? He was reading my transcriptions. Oh, this is hilarious. I didn't understand all of it, so I made some of it up. A baby doll makes a filthy poo? Well, what should it be? A case of airplane glue. Mm, I expect there are other mistakes. You should write your own songs. If I did, I'd make them less rude. Rude? That brown shoe song. One of our most popular. Probably, because it's so rude. Well, your perception says more about you. A 13-year-old girl doing things with a middle-aged man? It's not nice. Hmm. Smothering my daughter in chocolate syrup. Mm. In your accent, it does sound kind of bizarre. Some might say that this song is actually about incest. Get your notebook. Take this down. Okay. Plastic People is about the insincere assholes who run almost everybody's country. Brown Shoes Don't Make It is a song about people who manufacture inequitable laws and ordinances unaware of the fact that the restrictions they place on young people are the result of their own sexual frustrations. And Son of Susie Cream Cheese, what's the stirring saga of a young groupie? Her actions are motivated by a desire to be in at all times, hence the drug abuse. Does that make sense? I... Suppose it does. Good. Some of us are going to the speakeasy later. Would you like to be my date? Soho was like a film set in the rain. Pink neon reflected in puddles. The hip music set everywhere. Crochet dresses, golden boots, palazzo trousers, lilac shirts... Capes, tunics, and haltenecks. Well, the queue starts back here! It's okay! Guest list! The speakeasy was smoky and busy with faces. We took in the scene. Then Frank whispered in my ear. Well, let's see how we move together. Okay. It's a tight hold. Well, I'm a good dancer. It's important I hold you close. (laughs) Everyone else has sat down. (laughs) Oh, they're staring at us. Well, let's give them something to see. (laughs) Suddenly, he put his cheek to mine and launched into a hammy tango. Marching us up and down, gurning, clowning, showing me up. 
<laughs> Can we sit down, please? Uh, what? What's the matter? It's fun. It's excruciating. Okay. Cool. Well, sit down. What's your Frank? Eric, hey, how you doing? This is Pauline. Hello, darling. Another musician. What instrument do you play? Guitar. You know, guitar. That's nice. Yeah, guitar. So what's up? I'm with some people who'd love to meet you. He took Frank away. I sensed I'd said something wrong. I sat alone thinking about the absurdity of the universe. Eventually, Frank came back. You really don't know Eric Clapton? Should I? Well, he's your country's greatest rock and roll guitarist. I don't know anything about rock and roll. I was brought up on Russell of Spring. Okay. <clears throat> Do you want a drink? I won't. We stared in different directions, the moment slipping away. Then another group of musicians took Frank off again. Suddenly, I felt very silly. What was I thinking? Country, but the principle really still does remain the same. I mean, for us, the First Frank. Amendment is really important. Frank, and it's important Frank, for I'm, I'm, and our... I'm going. Oh, so soon? Yes. Bye. Bye. So anyway, like I was saying, I mean. I stumbled out past the people still waiting to get in, my stomach in my shoes. A month passed. It wasn't easy to forget Frank. He was everywhere promoting his concert. On the radio, on the cover of Melody Maker wearing a dress and a top hat. And on television too. And a concert next week? Yeah, at the Albert Hall. Me and the band. With a mystery woman standing beside him. Are you with the band, miss? <laughs> My name is Susie Cream Cheese. Uh, Frank, is, is she your girlfriend? Or something? <laughs> or something. <laughs> I bought a ticket. I was wearing a royal blue beaver coat and a hairpiece that made my hair bounce on my collar. Ladies and gentlemen, the mothers of invention! Frank ambled onto the stage looking tall and extraordinary. He adjusted a dial, did his shoelace up, chatted with his jumble sale band, then approached the microphone. You're not gonna like any of this! And then it began. It was remarkable. He was magnetic. Every movement compelling. The music was light, joyful, vibrant. And then it was complex, dark and deep. Frank conducting with total control by the slightest flick of his hand. This music will appeal to dumb teenagers. Susie Cream Cheese was on tambourine, dressed like a cowboy. I don't think you're ready for this one yet. The diversity and intelligence was dazzling. Afterwards, I found myself outside the stage door. I watched Frank signing autographs from a little distance. Pauline! <laughs> Pauline, how are you doing? <laughs> Great show. Thanks. Hey, you coming to our party? The hotel suite was filled with famous faces. Susie Cream Cheese was with men I later discovered with Jeff Beck and Ronnie Wood. Another of the girls saw me, Christine. She was with Herb, Frank's manager. 
She made a beeline for me. And who are you? Uh, Pauline. I've been doing some work. You screwing Frank? Would you be jealous if I was? Come on, girls, let's be cool. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. Aren't we, Pauline? This strange world spun around me. Later, it was quieter. Frank and I were alone in his hotel bedroom. And most of the audience were stoned. I wasn't. No? I smoked marijuana a few times, but it gives me a sore throat. Mm, losing control is one of my worst fears. Yeah. yeah I don't want a drug-retarded mind. I was offered LSD at a party once. Yeah? I said, what, do you want to give me money? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you are funny, Pauline. <laughs> Come here. He was sitting on the bed. I was in a chair. I was concerned that if he lunged at me, my hairpiece would fall off. I'll join you on the bed, but I'd rather we sat separately. Okay. <laughs> there. All these men you meet in hotel rooms. Do you get any nookie? Well, I've never been propositioned. Oh, I find that hard to believe. Sometimes they ask me to stay for a drink. And? I refuse. I do my job and I go. But not with me. You didn't ask me to stay for a drink. I invited you out. Well, that was different. <laughs> Pauline, you are... it. It? Unique. Well, no one can be totally unique, of course. The only truly unique person would be someone who is born old, who then gets younger and then dies when they're a baby. Wow. I'd like to meet that person. <laughs> I'd never known a man listen with so much respect, no matter what rubbish I spewed out. We talked into the night. But the band had to be in Amsterdam for a concert, leaving early the next day. Frank needed sleep. This is Herb's number. He always knows where I am. If you're ever in New York. Thanks for a lovely evening. I pecked him on the cheek and left. Mm -hmm. When I got to the door, I glanced back. He was smiling. I'd been saving for a holiday. Besides, I wanted to visit my older sister who was living in Washington. So, four months after Frank's Albert Hall show, I was on my way to America. After a few weeks in Washington, I decided to see New York City. Herb Cohen. Uh, Mr. Cohen, this is Pauline Butcher from England. I was with Frank at... Uh, Frank's the... not here. Oh, I'm in town. I wondered if he had any work. What's your name again? Pauline Butcher. Give me a number. I'll call back in ten minutes. I felt certain he wouldn't. Hello? Frank's in the studio all evening. Here's what we can do. You and I go out to dinner. I'll take you to his apartment afterward. Mm, that okay? We ate at the Russian Tea Room on West 57th Street under real Picassos on the wall. I wore a coat of rabbit fur and beige leather. He goes from doo-wop to classical and no one can keep up. Is he a guitarist or a politician? Is he a poet or Mozart? Mm. You heard Freak Out? Uh, no. It inspired the Beatles to make Sergeant Pepper. I hadn't heard of Sergeant Pepper either. Frank is a puzzle. In some ways, he's way out there. In other ways, he's more conventional. Have you met Gail? Gail? Hmm. 
His wife. Frank had a wife? They got married last September. Oh. He never said. Hmm. She was nine months pregnant. Herb couldn't come with me to Frank's apartment. He put me in a taxi. It was dark and late when I arrived. Gail was on the doorstep. We drank tea. Gail was friendly and chatty. Frank was quiet, distant. Moon, their baby, was cute. But I was so out of place in so many ways. I hoped for a few moments with Frank alone. Thought he might escort me to the taxi when I left, but he just gave me a hug. It was Gail who waved me off. And that was that. But as my taxi pulled away, I looked down at my hand. When he hugged me, Frank had given me a piece of paper. It was his home phone number. I'm he was married with a family. I had no intention of using the number. I put it away, forgot it. And then, when I was due to return home to England, as I was packing, the phone number sort of fell into my hand. I dialed it, just to say goodbye. Pauline, I'm so pleased you called. Gail's in California. You hungry? He was wearing a red woolly hat. And he was the Frank I knew again. I've been commissioned to write a political perspective. Oh. A book about how 240 million Americans are deluding themselves that they are God's chosen people. Good, a book? That's wonderful. Hmm. I'd like to talk to you about it. Oh, of course. Somewhere more private? We went back to his apartment and sat on the sofa together. So, I need a secretary to type the book. Would you come to California? Are you teasing me? Gail is looking for a house right now. But I'd need a visa. Well, can you play the flute? Goodness, they have tightened immigration. <laughs> Artist exchanges don't need visas. Mm, I see. It'll be cool. May I touch your hair? I'm very glad to have met Gail. Are you ticklish? What? <laughs> Frank! Can my mustache tickle you? Hey. Don't you like being kissed? I'm just surprised. <sighs> so you do like being kissed? Oh, gosh. Get off. <laughs> If we screwed, could you still work for me as my secretary? I looked deeply into his eyes, and he looked into mine. Then I remembered something Lady Reese Williams said. Once a man has caught the bus, he wants to get off. What do you think? It, it wouldn't make any difference to me. But you might think it would make a difference, and, and, and that could be problematic. I had no clue what I'd just said. Yeah. I think so, too. Anyway, let's see what we can do about getting you that visa. I didn't go back to England. I went to my sister's in Washington and waited to hear from Frank. The same week, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. A somber mood descended everywhere. And in the middle of this sadness, I started wondering about what I was doing. Visiting New York was one thing, but going to California? We can make it work if we put you on the books as a composer. We'll say your songs are flops. Write them off. So, you coming? Yes. I'd love to. Yes. Cool. $70 a week plus room and food. That okay? It's brilliant. So has Gail found somewhere? A log cabin. Laurel Canyon. In the hills overlooking Hollywood. I think you'll like it. And so, I headed to Hollywood and a new life.
Christine showed me around. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> me too. Do you like the place? Yes. The log cabin had 14 bedrooms, seven bathrooms, a swimming pool, a treehouse, a pond, and caves underneath. Of course, it needs fixing up. Mm. It was filthy. Windows broken, carpet stained, wallpaper curling and rotten, obscene graffiti. Two men were unwrapping a grand piano. I didn't know who lived there or who was just hanging out. Frank, Gale and Moon have the room upstairs. This is you. Oh, there was sticky paint on the floor, rubbish everywhere, and a hole in the window that looked like it had been made by a bullet. But it was 12 feet by 12 feet, and it was my room. Would you like to smoke a joint? Only we have to have it outside, because Frank wouldn't like anyone getting high inside. I'm with Frank on that. No, thanks. No sweat. We're going to be friends, though, aren't we? Pauline! Come here. Look at you in Hollywood. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Here I am. Hey, you look beautiful. Oh, thanks. <laughs> this is a long hug. You happy? Yes. Great. Hey, you got your notebook? And my Bic pen. Well, we're making a list of all the things that need doing to the house. You ready? We moved through. Room by room. We'll knock this wall through to make a rehearsal room. Write that down, Pauline. De rehearsal space? Uh, speakers over there. And well, what's down there? Come on. This way. There are lots of secret rooms and corridors in this place. Yeah. Isn't it perfect? Mm. Now this. This is a great space for a mixing desk. We're going to need PowerPoints here. Uh, mixing desk PowerPoints. Oh, this studio is going to be state-of-the-art. Let's keep moving. Come on. We were making notes till late. Girls hung around. They dressed outrageously in lurid tights, see-through dresses and had wild hair. I want some of the girls to tell you their stories. Would you type them up? They looked like crazy dolls. A strange mixture of kooky, fragile, tough, and vulnerable. Do you want me to get their stories? Who they are, where they're from, what brought them here. Uh, Frank wasn't concerned with the upper echelons of society. He was interested in the screw-ups, like Christine. Pauline. Yes? All these handsome young men around here. Have you? I mean, you know, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> Just checking. Some kind of love. A margarita total. Cup of tea? Oh, thanks. <sighs> I think this is beginning to come off. I wanted my room to be spotless. I bought a carpet cleaner, and when I used it, a brown-pink pattern got revealed. I bought a brown bedspread, covered my desk and chair with black paint streaked with gold, added an antique standard lamp, wild curtains, coordinating cushions, and a Trechikov print of a man's blue face. And I was learning new skills all the time. Now, put the egg in. Don't let it crack. Like that. All you have to do is wait a few minutes, and you've got yourself a boiled egg. Easy as that. <laughs> I can cook two things. Two? Eggs. And toast. <laughs> oh, my mother will be so proud. <laughs> Soon, Frank was composing, and the band were rehearsing in the house. We were a big, beautiful family. Frank, Gail, Moon, Pam, Christine, the freaks, the band, and me. 
One day, a pretty blonde girl and a guy with a droopy moustache turned up in cowboy hats. Someone told me it was Joni Mitchell and David Crosby. From then on, many famous musicians dropped by. Captain Beefheart, Rod Stewart, Peter Talk of the Monkeys, Clapton, Mama Cass. Even Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful came to play in our basement. I sat watching, tapping my foot. They all jammed with the band in the court of Frank Zappa. And Frank's head was always filled with new ideas. Come in. You busy? I'm uh, just reading. You know, your room is the cleanest in the house. Thanks. Was there something you wanted? Oh, I'm going to run for president. Of what? The United States. Oh, well, you have the political mind for it. I know. Will enough people vote for you? Oh, every town has people who get my music. Well, we can build on that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, when are you going to jump on one of those guys? Thank you for your concern. Oh, think of the delight that you are missing. I'd like to be wrapped in the realms of love before sex enters my head. <laughs> and what kind of wazi believes that? Well, apparently I do. I thought men liked girls to be virgins. It doesn't matter to me how many guys a girl has been with. I still didn't have a boyfriend. And the band did hit on me. But it hadn't felt right. They were so direct, it wasn't my style. I found my cool responses made them act like gentlemen. Oh, no. <laughs> Motorhead did? <laughs> he was polite about it. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah, well, I was on the back of his bike. He turned and said, Pauline, would you like to get laid? <laughs> <laughs> and what did you say? I said, that's awfully kind of you, Motorhead, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> we saw the guys perform whenever we could. Frank surrounded himself with great musical talent. We were all part of it. Living at the cabin was an education in itself. It felt like the whole world was changing. And I was part of the change. Who are they? Women's lib. They're marching uptown. There are so many of them. So many of us. Yes. It's all for us, isn't it? Respect me more. Love me less. One day, I caught sight of myself in a mirror. I changed. I was perfectly happy. We were living the beautiful dream. And I looked like a hippie. But for California, and for me, it couldn't last. One pill makes you larger and... It happened on a hot day. Some of us were sitting outside when the visitor arrived. Hi. Hey. Hello. Would Frank Zappa be here? Frank? Frank? Are you okay? I want Frank Zappa. Frank? Frank! Hey, what's the yelling? Hi. Who are you? My name is Raven. I have brought you a present, Frank Zappa. Oh, wow. Gosh. He took out a transparent bag filled with blood. It's for you. And this is for you, too. <sighs> he pointed a revolver at Frank's heart. Hello, Frank Zappa. Now put that thing down. Why? Put it down and I'll tell you. What? That thing goes off and the police will be here. And you'll be in big trouble. I'm already in big trouble. They'll lock you up. Uh, can't abide being locked up. Okay. Now the best thing you can do is to hide that gun. I only just got it. Well, you should get rid of it before the cops find out. I know a place. 
We're going to perform a mystical ceremony. Come on. I'll show you. Frank led, and we walked down to the pond, the gun still pointing at Frank. We reached the murky waters. Here's what we're going to do. <coughs> Frank threw a stone in the pond. Drop the gun in there, and the cops will never find it. It'll be our secret. We should all throw something in. One by one, we all threw stones into the water. I threw in a twig. It didn't sink. It nestled in some algae. Someone else threw in their shoes. It's your turn, Raven. You think I should... Go ahead. <laughs> Meet. Now here's your bag of blood. You must leave now. Frank put his arm round Raven's shoulders and led him off the property. I'd never seen anyone more calm, brave, or in control. It was amazing. It was a near miss, but real horror took grip in Hollywood soon after. There were lots of hippie groups in the valley, but unlike Frank, Charles Manson brainwashed his people to commit brutal atrocities. On the night of the 9th of August, 1969, some of his family entered the Hollywood home of the actress Sharon Tate, not far from our cabin. What happened reverberated around the world. Manson's followers took the lives of everyone. Tate had been eight months pregnant. The killers were pretty and young. Hippies, like us. Only they weren't like us. We heard the news in shock, and Hollywood changed overnight. We have to protect ourselves. Security gates were installed. Our neighbours were buying fences, guard dogs and guns. There were rumours Frank was no longer happy at the cabin. But I didn't have the chance to speak with him about it because he went away with a band on a tour to Canada. What have you heard? It's probably nothing, but... Gail said they're going to make changes. Do we have to leave? She doesn't want Moon growing up with guns all around. She wants a family home. Well, at least I'll still be working with Frank. Uh, I also heard that Phyllis is after your job. Phyllis was one of the girls who hung out. Pretty, clever, and she made Frank laugh. Was he on the verge of abandoning me? Trading me in? I needed to speak with Frank, but he was 2,000 miles away. It was a fast decision to go to him. And in the air, I doubted it. What if he confirmed he planned to give me notice? I sat in the lobby of his hotel, waiting. Hours passed. Pauline! What are you doing here? You have to raise? We never speak in Hollywood. I couldn't wait? Uh, um... You... Better come up to my room. My stomach twisted tight. I figure you didn't travel across America for a cup of tea. They're going to fire me. Well, I haven't told anyone to fire you. But you will? No. I won't. Am I safe? You came 2,000 miles to ask me that? <laughs> Come here. I think Phyllis is after my job. Well, first I've heard of it. So it's not true? Well, has this been worrying you? There's no one else I want to work for. And I get nervous when I don't see you. Would you like to spend the night with me here? I can't. Why not? Because we're more than that, aren't we? I, I don't want to ruin everything between us. <sighs> Come here. Your job is safe. <clears throat> is that better? I, I, 
think I've been sending you the wrong signals. What, you don't want Nookie? I love being with you. I love being with you too, Pauline. Well, love me less and respect me more. Oh, not the women's lip speech. <laughs> Listen, you come all this way, tell me how much you need me. That's a pretty strong signal. I do need you, but not like this. Maybe I thought it was what I wanted, but it's not. We have something more beautiful, something so personal between us, so unique, like nothing else. Don't you feel it too, Frank? Pauline. As ever... You're right. I do feel it. <laughs> now give me a hug for crying out loud. All right. <laughs> it was the closest we came to an affair. But it didn't happen. Our love wasn't like that. I carried on working with Frank for a while, but the 60s were nearly over, and it was time for me to go on my own way, go to university. It ended naturally, just like it began. The dream didn't turn sour for me, but things evolved and I grew. I took control of my own life. Frank and I stayed friends, right up to when he died, too young, aged only 52 of prostate cancer. He'll always be an important part of my life, a part of me, always and forever. I stop my rambling. In Frank Zappa and me, Frank was played by Ronan Summers, young Pauline by Lucy Briggs-Owen, and older Pauline by Richenda Carey. Herb Cohen was played by Simon Lee Phillips, Christine by Samantha Dakin, and Eric Clapton by Gareth Pierce. Frank Zappa and Me was based on the memoir by Pauline Butcher and written by Matthew Broughton. Frank Zappa and Me was a BBC Cymru Wales production, directed by Kate McCall. I had not...